Do you like making bad decisions? Are you 45, living in your mom's basement still and wearing Axe body spray? Do you have five too many cat bobbleheads on your dashboard? Did you make too many poorly written or overly convoluted movies and now your entire franchise is being saved by a little baby green alien with big ears? Well, here's some more bad decisions for you. For your first pet reptile, that is. So the animals from part one of this video, worst beginner pet reptiles you'll find in pet stores, still apply. If you go to a reptile expo and you see iguanas or chameleons, I usually would recommend away from them for your first pet reptile. But today I want to focus on animals that are almost exclusively sold at expos or maybe even online. These are animals you will probably never see in a pet store. These animals are on this list for a variety of reasons, like how big they can get, how much they need to eat, if their diet is really specific, if their care requirements are really specific, like their humidity and temperature if they have to get very big enclosures there's going to be a lot of things to consider with these animals in addition to those factors this one has another component we're going to take into consideration and that is how much damage these animals can do in the first list a green iguana bites you yeah that's going to mess you up savannah minor bites you that's going to hurt but none of that compares to some of the harm that some of these reptiles we're talking about today can cause these reptiles can do a lot of damage to a person whether it's with their teeth and their mouth whether it's with their sharp claws whether whether it's with hitting you with their really strong tail, like how you should hit the subscribe button. No, I don't think I'll put that in. Now the availability of these animals is also gonna vary depending on where you are. Here in New York, a lot of the animals I'm talking about today are actually illegal. But if you go across this line to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania has almost all of these legal. These animals, even if you are able to find them at expos, is going to vary depending on where you are. And this video is just my experience and opinion. These are just the reptiles I specifically say should not really be pets for someone brand new to reptile keeping. Honestly, I'd like to think a lot of these are just kind of common sense. Up first is an animal that isn't really difficult to take care of per se, and I would recommend them more if it wasn't for the fact that they get absolutely massive. So kicking it off with number five, the Sulcata tortoise. You can find them at most expos for 50 to 75, maybe $100. They come in a big bin, they'll have a whole bunch of little babies. And you'll get them about the size of a jumbo sized Oreo. But they don't stay that size. This is a very, very big reptile. They can easily hit 150 pounds, maybe even 200 pounds as an adult over a few decades of growth. And they can hit about three to three and a half feet, maybe even four foot carapace length. They are very, very big. And they are also the easiest to find widespread giant tortoise because the fourth largest tortoise, the mountain tortoises, those are a little bit kind of harder to find. And if you remember from our expensive reptiles video, the Aldabra tortoise, which is the second largest tortoise species, goes for insanely high prices. And then the world's largest tortoise, the Galapagos tortoise, is also endangered and also expensive. So the Sulcata is the biggest, cheapest one you're going to find. This tortoise literally needs its own room. They get so big, they can't be kept in a tank. You can't even really keep them in like an animal plastics PVC enclosure. You need something sturdy and big. And the farther away you get from the equator, the colder your winters get, which means that you probably cannot keep this tortoise outside year round. That's why you see a whole bunch of Sulcata breeders down in Arizona and Texas and Florida. You don't really see any up in Vermont or New York because they have to figure out what to do with them for the winter. You also can't keep them in a regular room. You can't just take a bedroom, section it off, and turn that into a tortoise enclosure because Sulcatas have insanely strong front legs, usually for digging, and they're a very determined tortoise. There are photos on the internet of these guys breaking through drywall. They are a very strong animal. You will need to have this with reinforced walls, and that doubles so if you keep them outdoors. They will blow through a lot of fencing. If you're keeping them outside, you need to give them a lot of space. They need, I would say, 20 foot by 20 foot minimum. They need a lot of room to move around, stretch their legs. They also graze on a lot of grass, so the more grass you give them, the happier your sulcata will be. And when you're keeping them in indoors, you need to give this tortoise UVB. They need those UV rays. That's what they get in the wild. That's what a lot of diurnal reptiles need. But when you have a giant tortoise in a room-sized enclosure, they're not going to sit in one space. If you get a single four-foot T8 bulb or T5 bulb, that's not going to be enough. So you'll need to get a few of these to spread out so no matter where the tortoise is walking around, they're getting some kind of UV exposure. And that can be kind of pricey because UV bulbs aren't exactly cheap. And this is a tortoise that eats a lot. 
All the other animals we're going to talk about on this list, they eat a lot, but no animal eats as much as a sulcata tortoise. Sulcata tortoise regularly, he is regular eating salads bigger than he is every other day. He gets so much food and that also causes sulcata tortoises to grow really big really quickly. That little baby tortoise that you buy at the expo, he's not going to stay that little for long. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard of in Long Island and down near New York City and other really not suitable tortoise type homes buying baby sulcata tortoises and then needing to rehome them when they outgrow their little tank in their apartment because a lot of people don't do research into what they're getting into. Sulcata tortoises live a long time. The last thing I want to talk to you about with the sulcata tortoise is their lifespan. Sulcata tortoises can live super super long. Snake lifespan usually 20-30 years maybe up to 40 for a big snake. Tortoises on the other hand your smallest tortoises are going to live 60, 80, 100 years. Sulcata tortoises they think can live up to 200 maybe even more. Something happens to me when I'm 30 what happens to my tortoise. If I'm 85 and I finally pass away, what happens to my only 60 year old tortoise who's got another 100 plus years to live? These are things you need to think about when you get such a long living animal. If you want a smaller pet tortoise for your first pet reptile that does not live 150 to 200 years and does not get super massive and destructive, I would recommend a Herman's tortoise, a Russian tortoise, an elongated tortoise, a red foot tortoise possibly, which they're a little bit more care intensive than a Russian tortoise, but still, those are all tortoises that stay fairly small. They will live a long time, but nothing like 200 years. For number four, tegus. Now tegus, just like the sulcata tortoise, they can make really awesome pets for the right person that knows what they're getting into, has the experience, they can take care of them, they have the right enclosure, all that stuff. But for someone brand new to reptile keeping, I don't think they're a good idea because they can be a big handful, as Norman proves almost daily. Hello, can I help you? Oh, we're going to start the climbing on me process. Okay. Now compared to your other big lizard species like iguanas and monitors, tegus are probably the easiest to quote unquote socialize, get used to you, kind of become more friendly to your presence. Monitor lizards and iguanas, for the most part, at least from my experience, not so much, but despite them being super cool pets and very intelligent, these guys are super smart, they are a huge handful. They need a lot of space. They get very big. This is an adult black and white tegu. Eight foot by four foot minimum, I would say. They need a big enclosure, probably even bigger if you can go for it, but I'm up here in New York, so I can't really put them outside year round. But down in Florida, I mean, I mean, you're gonna want something outside like 10 by 10 for them ideally they like a lot of space they also need a whole lot of substrate like we talked about back in the video where we actually built Norman's new upgraded home they need a lot of stuff to dig in because they're big burrowers so they need at least one and a half foot to probably two foot substrate depth they need a lot of dirt they also need it really really humid in that enclosure you're talking like a base humidity of about 70 percent in a very big enclosure which can be pretty difficult to manage now yeah compared to like a crocodile monitor or a green iguana a tegu is most likely going to be easier to socialize and get to like you but that still it's not like having a bearded dragon a leopard gecko a crested gecko they require a lot of time a lot of work sometimes you're going to be dealing with some unpleasantness like getting pooped on or bit or tail whipped especially when they're younger so you need to put in a lot of time to make this lizard really friendly now norman here is an absolute sweetheart he's been brought to a bunch of programs over the years he's been pet by thousands and thousands of kids and he has never so much as batted an eye at those kids but he wasn't always that way when i first got him he was very tail whippy he bit me twice when he was smaller it took a lot of time on my part to get him to this point where he's this friendly where he'll climb up onto my shoulder and things like that and he's not afraid of mates he's not afraid of going to all these different houses and everything new environments he's not afraid of it because he is very used to it Charlie my red tegu on the other hand he's still a brat Tegu's diets are also more complex than just about any lizard that I can think of, or at least worked with. Tegus are omnivores. They eat a lot of food. It's not like feeding a monitor lizard where you're 
just worried about meat, whether it's bugs or some type of animal protein. My two tegus probably have the biggest food bill combined of any of my animals and they need a huge variety. He gets things like shrimp. I give him fish like tilapia and haddock fillets. He gets salmon sometimes. He gets chicks, he gets mice. He'll get ground turkey with the bones and organs and everything ground into it. He also gets a lot of fruits and vegetables. He gets like bell peppers, zucchini, squash, watermelon, strawberries, grapes. He gets a huge, huge variety of food. Now we talked about this in greater detail back in my Strangest Animals Part 2 video where we talked all about tegus, but tegu jaws are insanely strong. These jaws, with these big old jowls, these do so much damage. They have one of the strongest bites for the size of their head of any animal. Now if you want something like a tegu, but not tegu sized, and not with all the tegu weapons that they come assorted with, with their large claws and their very, very big strong tail, and obviously their very strong jaws, if you want something like a tegu, I would recommend a jeweled lacerta. Now if you want one for your first pet reptile, do a lot of research. They are kind of a bit more complicated than like a leopard gecko or a crested gecko, but they can make really awesome pets, and they're very intelligent they have a whole bunch of personality and they get a fraction of the size of this lizard so if you want something tegu like jeweled lacerta now on the spectrum of big snakes i would put the burmese python closer to the end of not the best beginner pet reptile out there by any means but it is definitely more docile definitely tends to be easier to work with than some of the other snakes in this group and when i say big snakes I don't mean boa constrictors. I don't mean carpet pythons like Dakan here. These guys usually max out six to 10, maybe 11 to 12 foot for a really big one. They don't get super, super big. A seven foot snake, eight foot snake, I would still feel comfortable working with by myself. I mean, that's what I have now. But I mean the really big snakes, snakes that on average get 12 plus feet, 16 foot, 18 foot. These are very, very massive snakes. A tegu will do some damage to you and a sulcata taurus will definitely do some damage to your property. But if you get bit and start getting wrapped around and constricted by a 18, 19 foot anaconda, Burmese python, reticulated python, whatever, that is life-threatening. That is serious. An 18-foot snake can easily overpower an adult human. You cannot get that off you. You need extra set of hands on deck when you're working with a snake that big. The muscles on these snakes are absolutely insane. They are so, so strong. Holding a 10-foot boa constrictor is nothing like holding a 10-foot reticulated python or a Burmese python. These are snakes that need respect. They need experience. This is not something a newbie should get. A newbie should never go out and buy a Burmese python or reticulated python. Big snakes, like I said, very very big obviously so they need a lot of space they need something that they can kind of stretch out in they don't need as much space as like some of the other reptiles we're about to talk about or even a sulcata tortoise sulcata tortoise needs a very very big enclosure a burmese python if you have a 10 12 16 foot burmese python you're going to need something like 4 by 8 4 by 10 probably a six by 10, something like that, so that they can fully stretch out and move around. Now, big snakes, not super, super active, but you still wanna give them a space that they're not super cramped in. These snakes are also gonna need a pretty big water area. You're gonna need something that is probably kind of hard to lift on your own, so you'll probably need to put something in permanent that you can clean and filter and drain, especially for a green anaconda. Green anacondas are mostly aquatic, so they are going to need basically a mini pool just to themselves, and they are very, very strong, so the filtration you put in there, you have to make sure they can't knock it out, or it's gonna end not well for the enclosure, or maybe your reptile room, depending on the flooding. And lastly, a big snake means big food. You can't get away with feeding an 18 foot Burmese python big rats like you could an eight to 10 foot boa constrictor. You're gonna have to feed them something very, very big like rabbits or even I've heard of chickens, I've heard piglets even. You're gonna need really big food for these massive snakes. And that can be hard to acquire. It can also be very pricey to acquire. Now on the plus side, they don't eat as often as your monitor lizards or your tegus or anything like that. They don't eat nearly as frequently, but their meals are going to be that much more expensive. If you're dead set on getting a big snake, you want something that gets kind of bigger and more impressive than a ball python or a corn snake or a rat snake, I would mostly recommend boa constrictors. I think boas, again, they get fairly big, but if you can get a dwarf island species or something like that, they'll max out four to five, maybe six feet. That's a much more manageable size. If you wanna get something like a plain boa constrictor, like what I have, they'll max out usually eight to nine feet. Now I know in part one of this video we talked about savanna monitors because I was talking about five of the worst beginner pet reptiles you can find at pet stores and for some reason 
Pet stores insist on selling wild-caught little Savannah monitors that really almost none of them survived for the first year. But in this video, we're gonna open that up to more monitor species, specifically the big monitors. There are other monitor lizard species for sale at expos that I also don't think make good beginner pets at all. Even your smallest monitor species they need a lot of research, they need a lot of time and dedication, they still need a good bit of space. Really all monitors I would say should be avoided for your first ever pet reptile, but these ones like your Timor monitors, your Quince monitors, your Argus monitors, they're not going to get anything longer than usually five, maybe five and a half feet, which is still a very big lizard like Norman here. But today I'm talking about your Nile monitors or Nate monitors, your white throats, your black throats, your water monitors. These lizards, they get absolutely massive. Now, what I would say is probably the most quote unquote beginner friendly monitor species would be the Aki monitor. Aki monitor monitors are absolutely awesome. They're one of my favorite monitor species. They don't get very big at all. You're talking a max of a foot and a half, something like that. And they still need a good bit of space, but it's not something like a room. It's more something like a six foot by three foot enclosure. Much, much more manageable. But Aki monitors can be kind of pricey. Aki monitors, you're looking somewhere in the three to four, maybe 500 range. Whereas a Nile monitor, you can pick up for 50 bucks. Now I do have one of these monitors, Simon, my ornate monitor lizard, but he is not what I would call a fan of me. So we're going to be talking once again with Norman, my black and white tagu, who is my sweet puppy prince. They need very, very, very high basking temperatures. Something like 130, 140, even 150 degrees Fahrenheit. They like it very, very toasty. And this can be difficult because this lizard in case you didn't know, big lizards are also very, very destructive. So you need to make sure that this big lizard can't get up to the bulbs to break them because usually UV bulbs are pretty expensive. You also need to make sure that the giant, giant enclosure that you get for this big lizard can actually keep them inside and contain them because you don't want them breaking out. Trust me on this. You do not want to play catch the angry ornate monitor in the reptile room. Big lizards need huge, sturdy enclosures. And I'm talking not just like a four by eight, like what you have with a tegu. You need something for an adult Nile monitor. You need something like a room. You literally need a 12 by 12 foot room. They need a huge space, if not even bigger. They need a lot of room. And they also need it, again, pretty humid in these enclosures because these lizards, they're not from deserts. They're from marshes and wetlands and grasslands and things like that where there is a good bit of humidity. So you, again, just like the tag you, this huge enclosure you need to keep pretty humid. And if you have a giant 12 by 12 foot room dedicated to your lizard, you're probably gonna have to run a humidifier or two in this room to make sure it, that it's what it needs. These big lizards also need a very big water area. It's something they can actually get into, submerge, swim around in. If you've watched Camp Cannon, I'm sure a lot of you have seen his monitor's big pool that he built outside. They need something like that. They need a really big pool. And because monitor lizards also like going to the bathroom in their water, that means it's going to get very gross very, very quickly. So you will need some type of very powerful filtration on that because monitor lizards go to the bathroom a lot and it is very, very gross. While not having the very diet of a tegu, a monitor lizard still eats a lot of food, but it's all animal protein. So when they're young, you're gonna be going through a lot of dubia roaches, superworms, crickets, when they are full size, you're gonna be going through a lot of chicks, mice, fish, things like that. And that can get very, very pricey. Now, like I said with the tegus, monitors need a lot, a lot of work to socialize. Your big monitors, your Niles, of the water monitors, a lot of them are going to be wild caught. Now, if you're lucky and you get a captive bred one, or if you buy a captive bred one from a reputable breeder, that's gonna make it a little easier on you, but especially your wild caught Niles. There's a reason why they're $50 and it's one of the largest lizards on the planet. Take the work that you think you would need for a tegu, multiply it probably by like nine to 10. They need so much more work. Even my iguanas did not need as much work as a lot of the monitors I've worked with. They just, they are so intelligent. They know how strong they are. They know the weapons they have. They know where to get you. When you get a monitor lizard, this is not like owning a bearded dragon. It is not not even like owning a tagu, nothing prepares you for owning a monitor lizard. If a savanna monitor or a mangrove monitor bites you, it is not going to be a fun time. It's gonna be a very painful bite but you'll recover. If an adult Nile monitor bites you, that is most likely a trip to the emergency room because they have a wicked, wicked sharp set of teeth. They have super fast necks. They can turn on you and get you really, really quickly. And they have a tendency to not let go. They also have a very, very strong tail. It is 
one of the most serious reptile bites out there. So again, if you're dead set on getting a monitor, I would highly, highly recommend away from getting a big monitor for your first one. Now you would think number one wouldn't need mentioning, but every year without fail, reptile rescues around the country are getting calls about abandoned, confiscated, seized, surrendered, pet crocodilians, pet alligators, pet caiman, pet dwarf crocodiles. These are animals that really do not make good pets for 99.999% of people. And yet, if you go to certain states, like Pennsylvania is a big one, you can get a pet crocodile, a pet caiman, or a pet alligator for not a lot of money. Now, alligators tend to be kind of the most popular ones of these. They're the most common because a lot of people can wild catch them in Florida and things like that. American alligators can easily hit 10, 12, even 15 feet in length, and they grow that pretty quickly, by the way. And they can get quite a few hundred pounds in weight. This is a very, very big, dangerous crocodilian to people that are not prepared for it. This bite will definitely do a lot of damage. Now, a lot of your dwarf caiman species and things like that, obviously they're not gonna get as big. Your dwarf caiman end up somewhere four to five, maybe six feet in length. It's nowhere near as big of a crocodilian, but generally they make up for it with a really bad attitude. Nile crocodiles, a lot of big crocodiles, they are big enough to kill and consume humans. American alligators is very, very, very rare, but it could happen. Cayman, your dwarf cayman, that's not going to happen, but still, it's not a pleasant bite. It's not something you want to experience. I know Nerd sells some hand-raised, like fourth, fifth generation, apparently calm cayman, but you're paying like $3,000 for those, so people that buy those are usually a bit more prepared. Crocodiles obviously need a lot of space. You really can't keep them indoors in a house. You basically need some type of animal facility. You also need an extremely large water area. You need something with a lot of filtration because the crocs really only come out of the water to bass. They're eating in the water, they're pooping in the water. They going to do a lot of gross stuff in that water. So you need some of the strongest filters known to man. This pond is going to get gross super, super quickly. This water gets straight disgusting. So if you ever get a crocodile, just know you're gonna need a lot of land, you're gonna need a lot of space, you're gonna need a very, very big pool that you won't be allowed to swim in because if you do, it won't end well for you when a crocodile or an alligator is in it. They're also very strong, in case you didn't know. They have been known to just rip out and destroy tubing and filtration, which can also lead to a lot of flooding if it's kept indoors. They are going to destroy decor and logs and other things in there. They can easily climb fences if there's no lid on it. They can break through fences. And again, recurring theme today, Crocodilians eat a lot of food. Crocodilians eat an insane amount of food. I would say probably more than an adult sulcata tortoise, if I'm honest. I probably misspoke earlier, but most people don't really have crocodilians. I do run into a lot of people with sulcata tortoises. On top of all of this, is the damage they can do. Crocodiles can do such an insane amount of damage to a human. It is unreal that people try to keep these as private pets. There is a reason why they have barely evolved since the dinosaurs. These are primordial, apex predators that do not belong in people's bathtubs or basements because these are animals that no one, really no one, should have as pets. As far as a similar recommendation as far as pets go, I really don't have one, so just don't get a pet crocodile. So those were my picks for five of the worst beginner pet reptiles that are sold at expos. Honestly, there are a lot more sold at expos that really shouldn't be considered as a first pet for a lot of people, like snapping turtles and mata mata turtles, and like I said, most other monitor lizards, but these are the top five worst ones in my opinion and experience. So. Comment down below if you agree or disagree with me. Like the video if you learned something. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you later. Hello. <laughs> Sometimes he might <laughs> just be a brat. <laughs> what are you doing?